Okay, um, as, we, as we talked about, you know, nowadays we're hearing more about, you know, uniportal versus biportal and interlaminar and things like that, right? But as you said earlier, the history and the foundation of full endoscopic surgery is transferaminal, right? And, you know, the reason why I think transferaminal is so impactful is that this is literally the least invasive way to access the spinal canal. So a quick shout out to the uh, ESRG that we heard about and uh, uh, ISERF. So this is the big picture here. I think if you glean one thing away from this, uh, this talk, it's, it's basically this, right? This is a busy slide. There's all sorts of angles going on. But the whole point of this is the, this is a nice way of showing you that you can access the spinal canal through the foramen and get anywhere you want, right? So the transferaminal approach allows decompression of the spine through the natural orifice. And so this does not require the destruction of normal structural elements, such as the lamina, ligamentum flavum, medial facet, things like that, just to get to ventral pathology, right? I mean, we're so used to the norm being, okay, we have to take out normal lamina, normal ligamentum flavum, maybe some medial facet, just to get to the problem. Whereas with transferaminal surgery, we're getting to the problem without taking any of that. So that's, that's where the power comes from. And you know, I heard this term recently at a meeting about um, uh, surgeons who are interested in endosc endoscopy as being endocurious. And so, you know, I think most uh, endocurious surgeons, when, when they, they ask me about endoscopy, they, they say, oh yeah, I mean, it must be great for foraminal and extraforaminal discs. Well, yes, that's, that's definitely true, but that is quite literally only the tip of the iceberg because we can go all the way in, right? We can take care of the foraminal stenosis, then we can get central, we can get paracentral. You can even decompress the lateral recess from outside in. We can take the ligamentum flavum from outside in. Um, you can access discitis, abscess, phlegmon, epidural tumor, synovial cyst, retained objects, you name it. You can do anything transferaminal. So this diagram is basically just showing you that the laminar window decreases in size from caudal to rostral, and conversely, the foramen become larger um, from uh, caudal to rostral. And so um, for me, uh, the transferaminal axis is my approach of choice for L4-5 and above. Um, generally at, at L5-S1, I'm going for foraminal discs and extra foraminal discs um, uh, with the transferaminal approach only and then interlaminar at L5-S1 otherwise. You guys all know about Cambin's triangle. Um, obviously the, the, the place that we're trying to access safely is this zone right here. And the triangle was reclassified into a prism back in 2019. And that makes sense from our perspective because we're working uh, around the normal structure. If you are looking at Cambin's triangle as a fusion surgeon, then it's not a three-dimensional structure because the facet joint is already out, right? But we have to consider the, the boundaries of the facet joint and the fact that this is a volumetric uh, prism. So the first um, way to access this is a direct inline uh, approach. And this is sort of um, what uh, Christoph was showing earlier, just a direct uh, inline um, uh, approach straight into the disc uh, to facilitate um, discectomy and fusion. And then the 1B axis is probably the more traditional way. And the whole idea is we're targeting the part of the prism that is furthest away from the exiting nerve root. And that would be at the medial border of the pedicle and at the pedicle vertebral junction below. So again, this is a, a pictorial representation of that. You see on the AP, the targeting point for your needle is gonna be the medial border of the pedicle at the um, posterior vertebral body uh, of that uh, pedicle um, as well. And then on the lateral, you can see that's the, the, the target point on the lateral. And then in general, if you wanna take a cranial to caudal approach, this is known as a transismic line. Uh, and I'll just give you a quick um, pictorial representation. So cranial is to the left and caudal is to the right. And so this is a, an example of an L3-4 targeting. And you can see this transismic line, which is representative of the line that's drawn in panel B. Um, but there's various ways to actually do the targeting, and we'll go through all of that uh, more in the lab tomorrow. So the general targeting guidelines are, at L5-S1, the skin entry point is about 12 to 14 centimeters off the midline. 4-5 uh, is 10 to 12. 
three, four, eight to 10. And then once you get above that, you need to pay attention to the retroperitoneal organs, right? Um, the more medial your pathology is, like a central disc, the more lateral you have to start and vice versa. And then the larger the patient, the more lateral you must start and vice versa. And that's why I say that these are just general targeting guidelines, right? This isn't gonna work on everybody. And so where do these numbers come from? So if you just take a random patient, you measure on this particular patient at L45, they're about 12 centimeters off the midline if you want to access the lateral recess, right? And then if you want to go even more central, then you see that you have to be a couple more centimeters more lateral. And then if you take a, a different example of a patient who's much larger um, and uh, they have a lot more dorsal fat, then look at this. You know, you're up to 16, 17 centimeters off the midline. And so that's where these numbers come from, and that's why it's a general guideline. So, you know, this is an example of a, of a very large patient where I'm, you know, so lateral that it looks like it could be a, a, an exliff incision, right? Sorry to say exliff at, at this, uh, at this uh, talk, um, and, and hubbed also. So um, this is, a, I think, an important concept that really helped me um, get to the next level with my uh, transfer animal practice, and I learned this from Christoph, is that um, it's really better to, to target and plan how lateral you are based on the sagittal plane of the spinous process. So I'll kind of explain what that means. It's, it's hard to conceptualize, but basically, if you want to access the lateral recess on any human being, if you start your incision at the plane of the spinous process, you'll get there. And so that standardizes this for any patient out there, no matter how big they are. It just means that if they're a bigger patient, then you're starting more lateral. So um, on the AP, I typically mark uh, a, a target trajectory, and I'm doing this here with a long jam sheety needle. So I'm hugging the ipsilateral pedicle, and I'm not taking too steep of a trajectory because I'm go just going for a, uh, a non-migrated disc herniation. On the lateral, uh, I am at the plane of the spinous process. And so here's a better representation of that. So see here, I've drawn the AP trajectory uh, on, uh, on the right here. And so what you do then at this point is you flip the C-arm lateral, and then you take your target tool, whether that's a jam sheety or, or an axis needle, and then you just sort of walk yourself down this line and then keep uh, taking shots until you're at the plane of the spinous process. So once you're at this point, then you know that if you make your incision, you will get to the lateral recess. Um, and then here again, just a, another uh, a representation. If you want to think about this for even more central herniations, you know, if you have to get more central, uh, you have to go a little bit more ventral and or lateral. So that means that sometimes you're targeting as ventral as um, the distance in between the dorsal facet line and the spinous process line. And then in rare instances, you may need to go all the way to the dorsal facet line um, to, to reach uh, so medial. So, Here's just a, a quick example of um, Camben uh, 1B needle axis at L5S1. This is a paracentral disc herniation. So I'm drawing the surface marking here. There's a, uh, an AP line to avoid the crest and the transismic line. And uh, when you're targeting with the needle, obviously lead off a little bit dorsal and shallow to be safe. You can always redirect. And this is what this diagram is showing, is that you can walk off the bone and redirect to get into the foramen to avoid the ventral structures. And so this is after placing the needle and, and placing the guide wire exactly um, where you want to be, which is um, roughly at the medial border of the pedicle at the posterior vertebral body. So then once you advance your dilators and reamers, uh, you can place your working channel, and you can see the, the tip of the working channel is at the medial border of the pedicle here, and then uh, you can achieve a, a transforaminal decompression. One C axis is the final thing I'll talk about. That is the trans-SAP, um, first described by uh, Sakib and... Hofstetter. And Hofstetter, so, sorry, something popped up here. It's, I have to change a password or something. Virus. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's on my computer. Uh, so this is the uh, uh, SAP, and so we're. Uh, this is all we're trying to remove, right? We're trying to take off the non-articular surface of the SAP to widen the foramen for the access. And really, this is what you're doing with the 1B access too. It's just that with trans-SAP, you're using a rigid needle to target that area to get into the bone and guarantee that that's where you're reaming. So. 
I think the advantages are you have decreased risk of DRG injury irritation. You have a more dorsal starting point, which is further away from the DRG. You have less chance of aberrant reaming, where your reamer slips off and goes into the foramen. And then there's a higher volume of up from uh, foraminoplasty, and then you get that more dorsal view of the lateral recess and ability to reach more central pathology. Disadvantages, theoretically, you could injure the traversing nerve root um, if you overream because you're more dorsal. Um, act, you can uh, take too much of the facet joint, too, if you start a little bit more dorsal as well. Um, and again, this is, this is what that looks like. So here is a, an actual um, representation of what this looks like uh, in a patient. So um, this is the targeting needle. You can see that I've, I've docked and I've, I've entered the ventral lateral SAP and then I'm, I'm at the medial uh, border of the pedicle here. I can drop the K wire, the dilators, and then we can start to ream and then place our working channel. So when you place the working channel, you want to be at the medial border of the pedicle and then uh, posterior to the dorsal line. So quick case example, 20-year-old female, two years of low back pain, bilateral radiculopathy after tennis injury. This is one year prior to presentation. Acutely worse uh, over three months. She's got a non-focal exam, bilateral uh, sciatica. And then you can see that this uh, herniation has uh, become quite a bit larger. This is quite central. She's got bilateral symptoms, a pretty narrow inner laminar window. So in a 20-year-old, you know, ideally, you don't want to take any facet joint, right? And so this is the, uh, uh, the targeting. So this is my trajectory line that I've marked out. And then I walk that lateral. And then here I'm starting, you can see a little bit more ventral to be able to see more central because it's a pretty central uh, herniated disc. So here's the spinous process line, dorsal facet line. And then, of course, I'm about uh, halfway in between. And then this is the access. And then this is a quick video. So this is a right-sided approach. Meg, how so did you decide to approach from the right? Because do you base it on the symptoms or where the disc is most prominent or where the foramen is the biggest, all of the above? All of the above, but I, actually uh, it's, it, her disc was a little bit more off to the right, so that's why I decided, even though her symptoms are actually more left-sided. Um, and so, uh, but that's a great question. Um, and then, so here, this is a quick video. Uh, cranial is to the right, caudal is to the left. And so you can see that immediately once you're there, you're on the disc and, and uh, the herniation is there. So I start the annulotomy and then start to debulk. Um, the thing that's a little bit unnerving at first about transferaminal surgery is you see the nerve uh, relatively later. Um, and so uh, once you start debulking, then the nerve starts to come into, uh, into view. And then at that point, once you see the nerve, you can, you can actually start to get a little bit more aggressive with your tools. Um, obviously, this was a subligamentous contained herniation. So uh, once we found the PLL uh, and the nerve root, you know exactly where to go to get all that disc herniation out. So the great thing about um, the transferaminal approach is you can actually see the ventral epidural space once you've decompressed it. You can see it pulsating right there. And then uh, you can actually look all the way across to the other side of the canal to know that you've achieved decompression in a central disc. So you can lift up the nerve root, and then if you, if you notice there, you can actually see the ventral dura and then see all the way across to the other side. So that's when you know you're done. And so this is uh, our prospectively collected data. You can see that peak recovery was achieved um, by post-op day four with minimal uh, uh, opioid intake. So the approach algorithm, I think transfer aminal is excellent. Um, this is from my talk last year uh, for uh, L4, uh, 5 and above, and then migrated disc herniations, except for the super high migrated ones. Quick ESRG data. Uh, this is uh, the current 403 transfer aminal um, patients that are in the database. Baseline characteristics undergoing transferaminal lumbar discectomy and foraminotomy. Uh, have to give a shout out to uh, Albert um, for having the most number of patients. And then interesting to note that 30% um, of these are, are revision surgeries. So uh, transferaminal is, is excellent for that. And then you can see that um, all these patients do exceptionally well. And so uh, obviously endoscopy is, is uh, just as good, if not better, than uh, traditional. So transferaminal is a workhorse of lumbar discectomy above 5.1 and non-inferior. It's the least destructive way to perform a lumbar discectomy, bar none. I mean, you, 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 it's, it, it's just no comparison even to a 14 millimeter tube. It's and then, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, uh, this can be done without general anesthesia and uh, it's a great option for revision discectomy. So thank you very much and uh, pleasure to be here.